These movies are so important for students to watch, for everyone to watch. I get a lot of students wanting to separate themselves from the Nazis, and that could never happen here. To think that we could not be participants in something like a, the Holocaust is just, it's arrogant. And, um, and it's incorrect. The Nazis were sinful human beings. They weren't crazy monsters. They were sinful human beings, just like you and I. I'm interested to talk with you, Julie, today because um, we are in a season of lots of really interesting films coming out. Mm -hmm. For those of you listening, the Oscars is probably history at this point, but History featured really well in the movies that were recognized for awards. We had Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. We also had movies like Zone of Interest and even Killers of the Flower Moon that had some kind of historical um, aspect to that. So I'm really interested to talk with you today on your perspective on those films and some in particular. Um, but before we get started, can you just tell us a little bit more about you as a professor, your approach to teaching history in the classroom? Um, what is it that interests you and, and how do you go about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I love talking history, and as my students know, I mention probably three or four movies in my class almost every single day, just because there are so many incredible historical films. Um, there are also a lot of really bad historical films, <laughs> yeah. uh, but we're not going to mention those today. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, my approach to teaching history is just, um, I love to tell stories. And I think too often students come to me and they say, I hate history. It's always been so boring. It's, I, I had it in high school and they just gave me a timeline. I had to memorize a bunch of facts and then spit them back out in a test. And that is not a good way to teach history because because it is very boring, right? Um, I think the best way to teach history is just to tell stories. Mm. And um, it's easier in some classes, you know, um, more than others, like, you know, Western civilization, we go pretty much from the beginning of time to around, you know, the 1900s. And yeah. um, so that that is more difficult, you know, with ancient history. But like my Nazi German class that I teach, it's one of my favorite classes. Um, just a, a, a shameless plug. I do teach it in the spring of 25. So next spring I'll be teaching it again. And it's one of my favorite classes to teach because um, we just get to sit around and talk about a lot of stories um, that, that happen. It's not specifically a Holocaust class, but that's one of the modules mm -hmm. that we get to discuss in the class. And and we sit around and talk about stories of the victims in the Holocaust and, and stories of, of the resistance fighters, uh, you know, Nazi Germany, and stories of... Um, you know, the perpetrators uh, of the Holocaust and, and of Nazi Germany. We talk about Adolf Hitler a lot, obviously. And so that's really my, my goal in teaching history is, um, yes, to make it fun and entertaining because I frequently tell my students Hollywood cannot write stories like that we find in history. Um, because it's just so incredibly fascinating. So yes, I yeah. want to make it fun and interesting, but uh, but my goal is just to make it come alive for students, and so they can really you know identify with it. Yeah. Um. And I and that's what I try to do in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you're here to talk with us today. Um. And it's great to hear about your uh, connection to storytelling, because mm -hmm. like you said, there are so many different avenues in history, yes. so many different stories that resonate. I think Oscars in general. Uh, when it comes to the Oscars and movies that get recognized and win awards, very often they have a historical component to right. them. Yes. The Oscars, they love history. Yes. Um, and so we have three or four uh, really great films that came out this year, in yeah. 2023 rather, that got, a, that got recognized <laughs> or featured in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of curious though too because mm -hmm. two really um, prominent films one was Oppenheimer that got mm -hmm. that won several awards, including Best Picture, Best Director. I think they won like seven awards total yeah. and were nominated for a lot more. Right. So yeah, they they definitely won a lot. Yeah, they definitely had a sweep. Mm -hmm. Then you had a le lesser known, probably film like Zone of Interest, mm -hmm. um, which we'll get into here in a minute. Yeah, but um, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, why is it that, um, that we have movies about history in general that seem to feature well? Um, why does it that audiences keep coming back to movies about mm -hmm. history and in World War II in particular? Yeah, it's a great question. I think because we're such a visual society um, that, you know, my students especially, they, they, it's not really good enough just to show a, a drawing, you know, or a sculpture of, of a leader. It's a lot better if I can show them a, um, a video or, or a, a film of this certain leader. And, and, um, and I think 
also these movies just kind of show the behind the scenes, or as much as they can, behind the scenes of these major events. Um, I always tell my students, like, I can talk about these events, um, or I can show you a movie about these events. And I, and I think for the most part, students are going to remember what they see, the movies that they see over just the stories that I might tell. Um, so I think movies and, and just visual media in general is so important to the study of history today, um, just so we can picture, you know, what went on in the past. Yeah, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. I think, too, there's something about World War II is, like, it's recent enough in – generationally right. um, that we have grandparents or great grandparents right. who have been a part of it that's still kind of in our culture and memory. Absolutely. I'm curious too because these two films in particular they are based in the war but they're not war movies. You know they don't right. portray battles, they don't portray mm -hmm. soldiers, they don't really they're not necessarily patriotic in that sense. Right. Yeah. Um, so I find that fascinating too. Well, I think something that's really interesting about both of these movies is they really are behind the scenes. We know about the atomic bombs, right? I, I teach that in my class every year. We know about the Holocaust, these these large events um, of, of catastrophic consequences, right? Um, but both of these movies show behind the scenes. Um, you know, it shows Oppenheimer. It shows him wrestling with these consequences of, oh my goodness, I built this weapon. And and now you know po possibly millions of people over the course of the you know how many centuries are going to die from this one weapon, um, and then of course with with zone of interest, um, it's the behind the scenes. It's the commandant of Auschwitz is Rudolf Hess, um, but it shows him just being with his family. It doesn't show really show him at work at all. It shows him you know behind the scenes with his family, and so I think. Um, showing these ordinary people, essentially ordinary people doing extraordinary things that had this major impact on the world for good or for not, you know, or for, for um, bad, just really resonates with people yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, let's get into a couple of specifics here. I yeah, want to absolutely. look at two films in particular, Zone of Interest and Oppenheimer. And for mm -hmm. those listeners who didn't watch these films, we just want to make clear that Oklahoma Wesleyan doesn't necessarily endorse everything that you see yes. in these films. Especially um, Oppenheimer. <laughs> yes. Um, so we, we definitely advise that you go into these movies if you're going to watch them uh, with a, a critical eye, um, a very um, wide open perspective to learn, but not necessarily um, to emulate everything you see. Right. Um, but there's, I think, a lot to be learned from these films. Um, Zone of Interest, um, for those who are listening who didn't watch this film, uh, the film centers on, centers on the Hess family, mm -hmm. Rudolf Hess, who was the commandant of Auschwitz mm -hmm. concentration camp, uh, and his family who lived just on the other side of the right. wall of the mm -hmm. camp. Uh, and the film is fantastic. I, I don't know that I've had a film that, that, that I've watched recently that has affected me as much as me this too. film. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. in the, and I still am thinking about it. Right. Um, yeah. I'm curious to know from your perspective, what were just kind of your initial reactions to watching the film? Yeah. So what's funny is I think you approached me maybe late last year or early this year, something. And one of the first things you said was, have you seen Zone of Interest? And every, every person I've talked to, I did a faculty seminar at the Holocaust Museum, faculty seminar at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And that was what the movie everyone was talking about. Mm, wow. And I've had so many people approach me, you're a historian, have you seen Zone of Interest? Yeah. You know. So finally I, I sat down. What I tell people is it is probably the most boring movie I've ever seen. It, it, <laughs> there's, it, there's really not a plot. Um, you do kind of have to know, you have to have a context of the Holocaust, yeah. of Auschwitz in yeah. Poland to kind of know what you're watching. Um, but it is also one of the most, I think, one of the most important and poignant films I've ever seen. Mm. Yeah. Um, the the sound, you know, and you could, might speak a little more to this, just being in that industry. The sound is incredible. The guy won Oscar for yes. it, deservingly. Yes. Um, because and I read an article about how you're almost you're watching one movie, but you're listening to exactly. another movie. Exactly. Because most of it is just this family living their lives. And if you didn't really pay attention that much, it would look like a it look like my family yeah. just living yeah. their lives. They're, they're having a birthday party. They're swimming. She's doing. She's meticulous about her gardening and 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 meticulous about her housekeeping and things like that. Um, but if you listen very carefully, in some scenes you do, there's a visual component to it. You're, you're hearing the screams of 
what you know to be Jewish people getting exterminated. You're seeing the smokestacks um, behind one of the most, the best scenes is this birthday party, this little boy's birthday party. Yes. A bunch of family is all swimming together and there's a smokestack behind them and yeah. you see this smoke just coming up and you know they can smell it. Yes. You know, and yes. um, it's just, it's one of these movies that is so important. I'm definitely yeah. incorporating it into my Nazi Germany class. Great. Um, wow. Because I, I feel like students just need to watch yeah. it because it's that important. Yeah. No, it, what you're saying about the sound is is a key component of it. It's it's like the the layer of of um, the experience that kind of informs you what's happening, mm -hmm. um, and kind of uh, it it almost kind of places you like you're a person in the scene in Definitely. the setting. You know, yeah. because you can kind of explain away was that a gunshot or was that a car backfiring? Mm -hmm. You know, was that right. what was that scream about? Was that a child uh, playing or was that something else horrific right. happening on the other side of this wall? Right. Um, yeah. And, sure. and as the movie goes on, you kind of see different uh, characters in the family. What you think is kind of maybe they're oblivious. You kind of realize how much they actually are internalizing what's happening around them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, light spoilers to the film. If you haven't seen it, we definitely recommend it. Um, I don't know that there's much to spoil in that I, sense of I a plot. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, again, there's, there's very little plots yeah. to, to the film. Yeah. Um, what you mentioned about the, 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 depiction of kind of everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, one of the quotes that came to me when watching the film, um, it, it seems like the film is really influenced by uh, a famous quote by Hannah Arendt, mm -hmm. who famously covered the trial of Nazi war criminal um, Adolf Eichmann, mm -hmm. and coined the phrase, the banality of evil. Mm -hmm. This kind of idea that how evil can be mundane right. um, when it's kind of pursued. It, like Adolf Eichmann wasn't necessarily a demonic um, person, but just kind of unthinking, just kind of right. doing their, their part in the machine mm -hmm. of fascism. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how you saw that idea come to mind to you while watching the film. Oh yeah, 100%. Um, and I love that you mentioned Hannah Arendt. I think in our emails to each other, uh, before this, just preparing for this, we both mentioned yeah. Hannah Arendt because it is, it is the, the banality of evil. Um, and, and, one of the quotes that she, in her book, um, I think it's called the, the Eichmann Trials, The Banality of Evil. Um, she says, evil comes from a failure to think. It defies thought, for as soon as thought tries to engage itself with evil and examine the premises and principles from which it originates, it is frustrated because it finds nothing there. That is the banality of evil. And th this film does such a, an incredible job of just portraying the everyday actions of someone who was actively participating in the extermination of an entire people. Um, it's almost like you kind of see to his two lives, if you will. You see his, his work life, which you don't, you know, and I think it's very very much done on purpose. You don't see him at work, right? Yeah. You see him <laughs> going to a couple meetings and there's a ball that's given in his honor and stuff like that. And he talks about work, but you don't actually see him at work. Um, but then you see his home life and it's entirely ordinary. And I think that's so important um, for students to understand, and this, this concept of banality of evil as well, that I think we want to, students especially, I get a lot of students wanting to separate themselves from the Nazis, and that could never happen here. I even had a, a student, this was a colleague in graduate school so years ago, I remember we were talking about um, the banality of evil, we were talking about another book called Ordinary Men, which I, I get people asking me all the time, what history book should I read? And um, and I tell them Ordinary Men. Mm -hmm. And it's about this um, this group of reserve, uh, reserve police battalion, 101st. They went around in Poland killing Jews. And they were not ardent Nazis, they were like my age. They, and so they were older, they knew something other than Nazi idiot but they went around and killed Jews, thousands of Jewish people. And, um, and, and hit Christopher Browning's argument is that these weren't ardent anti-Semites. These were just ordinary men. Um, yeah, some of them were following orders, but, you know, we can't really, yeah. that's not justification, right? And, and I think it goes along with this idea of the banality of evil. We, we would love, I would love to say, oh, the Nazis, Hitler, they're monsters, they're evil. I'd love to distance myself from them, but we can't, right? Because um, one thing I tell my students as human beings are human beings are human beings and while you know the the term history repeating itself history doesn't actually repeat itself as Christians we understand there's a beginning and middle and I always say yeah. praise Jesus there will be an end Absolutely. right but human nature doesn't change yeah. we are born sinful and so sometimes it looks like 
history is repeating itself, right? Yeah. And um, and so I think these movies are so important for students to watch, for everyone to watch, but I'm, I'm speaking yeah. in a... Um, history classroom context for the students to understand that like no this this could happen again these yeah. people are our ordinary men yeah. right yeah. um and it's really we we cannot think of them as some monsters who um perpetrated this you know evil that could never be right redone because yeah. it absolutely right. could be yeah. redone it has been since yeah. the holocaust yeah. right um i'm interested in what you brought up here too is and one aspect of the film is that how much it also shows, um, I, I'm blanking on her name, but the wife. Hedvig. The, he, Hedvig. Yeah, Hedvig Hess. Hedvig uh -huh. Hess and the children. And yeah. in a sense, it's kind of portraying not just that this was perpetrated by men, but it, mm -hmm. the complicity of her in right. knowing what she's participating in mm -hmm. and what her life is built on. Right. That, the, that even the, the garden she's so proud of is, is yeah. thriving because of the ashes yeah. that are being sown there. Um, how accurately, uh, or what maybe does that represent what we know historically about everyday people in Germany, civilians, mm -hmm. um, and their support of what the German government was doing? Yeah, so what's interesting is I think students, I, I once had a student, say, I, I said, you know, I'm interested in, in German history, it's kind of my thing, I have my master's and I, I um, I specifically studied the Third Reich in German history. And, and I mentioned, like, oh, yeah, I love Germany. It's, it's one of my favorite countries. And she goes, oh, Germany, Nazis. I'm like, well, <laughs> actually, only 10% of the German population were, were card-carrying members of the Nazi party, right? Now, that wow. does not excuse, their, you know, what um, the, the type of, of bystanders that we saw um, there's a great book by, by Raoul Hilberg, who is a historian, of a Holocaust historian. He wrote um, Bystanders, Victims, Perpetrators. And he basically said, we can't just put them into two camps of victims and perpetra perpetrators. There were also bystanders. And without the bystanders, this couldn't have happened. This, again, these are everyday people who maybe they weren't members of the Nazi party. Maybe they weren't ardent anti-Semites. Maybe they lived happily with you know Jewish neighbors prior to um, World War II to starting, but they also looked the other way. You know, they also tried to explain away um, the smell in the air, especially those living closer to concentration camps. Um, they tried to explain away, all of a sudden, my Jewish neighbor has disappeared. You know, and yeah. so these are not necessarily perpetrators. They're, they're bystanders. Um, but he also, Roel Hilberg also talks about how there is some overlap a bit. Um, one of the greatest examples is um, is Sachsenhausen concentration camp, which is right outside of Berlin. I've been there a couple times, and wow. it's, if you ever get a chance to go, you absolutely wow. should. But um, so the Jews were were killed. There were housed there and were killed there. And then after it was the Red Army, the Soviets that liberated this camp, and then they threw a bunch of Germans, especially a bunch of the SS, in this camp. And they were tortured, and it was horrific. Um, and so there's kind of this wow. this overlap of these perpetrators, these SS men, these guards in the camp. They're torturing, they're killing Jews. But then now they kind of attain this victimhood status as well because they're being tortured and killed by the Red Army. Um, and so there's all this overlap. And like I said, Raul Hilberg does a great job of that. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's kind of what we have to remember. There's not a dichotomy of victims and perpetrators. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. Yeah. And um, and Hilbert introduced that third uh, wing, if you will, of, of yeah. bystanders, yeah. which a lot of people fell into yeah. that category. There is one glimmer. It's interesting that you bring that up because there's one glimmer of hope mm -hmm. in, in what's otherwise a very dark movie, yeah. which is at night you see this local Polish girl sneak mm -hmm. into the campsite where the, the prisoners are working mm -hmm. and hiding apples or food in different places. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what you made of that part of the film. Yeah. And what that represents of what we know from history of people who saw what was going on and decided not to be bystanders. Right. Um, first of all, I would love like I, w I would love to sit down with the director. I mean, there's many reasons I'd love to sit down with the director, but I l I want to know about his choice to portray this girl. You might know what it's called, but it's a different. You know what I'm talking about? It's a different. Um, oh yes, that scene, the way it's shot. Yes, the way okay, it's yes. shot. It's it's a it's different. It's filmed in type. infrared. Yes, so that's basically, what it is. yes. yes. Okay. So basically, the way that the the kind of light it captures is different, and okay. so it pulls out different qualities in the skin yeah. and 
uh, it's it's so the effect is just so it's upsetting. It's very powerful and it's, very upsetting. Yes, yes it is. Um, it kind of to me was kind of like showing how alien this response is yeah, compared to what's maybe. happening. Yeah, maybe that is interesting. Um, huh? How how otherworldly it is that somebody is is taking this action mm-hmm. positively. Right. Um, and the sense of of you know is she going to be discovered? Is she going right. to be captured? Yeah. Uh, it, it made it even more <laughs> dramatic mm-hmm. in a sense to watch right. of kind of like I really hope nothing happens to yeah. this person. <laughs> right. um, so uh, I, I was also I'm curious to know your response though because yes. I have heard some behind the scenes stuff, but I'm curious to know just what what this represents because because one of the things that I read it, for this is that that character is based on a real person Interesting. who lived okay. near the camp um, and. I don't know if it's the house, but one of the mm-hmm. the sets involved was actually occupied by a Polish family mm-hmm. whose grandmother actually did this very thing that wow. they're depicting. Oh my goodness! And the dress that the character is wearing oh. is her dress. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's incredible. Um, wow, I feel like I want to go back and watch it again now. Yeah, <laughs> there's so many be- like wow. incredible details to yeah. the film. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, but I'm, but yeah, I, I mean, I think in some ways that character represents something. Absolutely, I think it represents all the little resistors. I think you know often we hear about in in books and movies the the large acts of resistance. Um, what the movie that just came out is One Life about Nicholas Winton, who was this British. Um, I think he was a stockbroker and he had he had some money and and so he spent a two-week vacation where he went to Czechoslovakia and he um, convinced hundreds of parents to give him their children he kind of saw the writing on the wall it was before 1939 but he kind of saw the writing on the wall which is pretty incredible it was before 1939 and he um and he convinced them to 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 send them send him their children so we went back to Britain after this two-week vacation if you will and just started working with the British government um to bring these children over here and then he did things like he um forged passports you know when he when he realized the government wasn't moving quick enough he started forging papers and documents to get these children over here and so he finally brought them over. Um, like 670 children oh my um, were brought over and were saved. And and um, and now there are you know 15,000 and counting uh, people that are alive today because of this one man's act of resistance, right? Um, there's That's incredible. A, another book show or another movie, Sophie Scholl, The Final Days. They printed pamphlets and handed them out at their university in Munich. They were beheaded for it, you know. Yeah. So these these pretty big acts of resistance. Um, you know, we see those and, and, and it's a good thing to learn about, but there are just these small acts of resistance, almost passive resistance is kind of a term that some historians use. Um, things like breaking equipment, um, working very slowly, uh, you know, things like that, forms of, of resisting. And it almost, you almost get the sense that these these prisoners, they're kind of gaining some agency from this as well. Like, this is my experience. This is what I'm having to go through. But um, this is, I'm going to control something, right? Yeah. And um, and so there was definitely forms of resistance, both within the camp and externally. Um, you know, there were um, instances of people feeding, um, you know, the Jews, hiding food so the Jews could find them, hiding, you know, either medicines or clothing, you know, things like that so the Jews could find them. Um, and so there, there's definitely forms of resistance. And I, and I love that they included that storyline and I love even more that, that your behind the scenes notes because I think that that offers hope you know Absolutely. I get kind of a hope for humanity that not not everyone yeah. was was in on this yeah. was in to exterminate um, yeah. the Jews what, what do you see from your students in in class you know when you start talking about this period of history mm-hmm. what kind of awareness do they have or lack of awareness and what kind of light bulbs do you see going off and, you know, changes in their thinking mm-hmm. when you're talking about this period? Yeah, I think students know about the Holocaust, right? They know about the big mm-hmm. numbers. Um, and by the, you know, so by the time they get to me, they know 6 million Jews died. Over 10 million people total died in the, the death camps of um, of the Nazis. And so what, what I try and do, again, I, I think I've been going back to this a lot, is I go back to the stories, and I, I particularly like to go back to the individual stories. And, um, and that way students can really try and identify with both the victims and the perpetrators and the bystanders in, uh, during the Third Reich. And so I think that's what's wow. so important for students to be able to picture themselves in that. And one of my, the greatest questions that I ask 
um, in class. And that's a hard question to ask is, would you have been a Nazi? Wow. And uh, it's very much a what would you do type, you know, situation. Yeah. I, I tell my students, you know, years ago, now I'm kind of, you know, I've, I've taught for a long time. I'm comfortable in front of a class. Like, I, I speak out against things. I'm pretty opinionated. You can ask my husband. Um, <laughs> but I used to not be very opinionated. I used to be kind of, you know, I don't like controversy. Like, let's just all get along, you know. And so I kind of had to have, in graduate school, you know, over a decade ago, I kind of had to have a, like, a, almost a come-to-Jesus meeting where I sat there and thought, I don't think I would have been a Nazi, but I might have been a bystander. I might have said, oh, guys, let's just, let's all try to get along. Like, yeah. surely nothing that bad is going to happen. You know, and that was, that was a big deal for me. I read Ordinary Men, and that really changed my perspective, you know, on, um, on things. And so I tried it to ask students that. Yeah. Like, what would you have done? Would you have been a Nazi? And sometimes that elicits some really interesting and really difficult yeah. conversations in yeah. the classroom, you know, really yeah. good conversations that I think are so relevant to yeah. today. Yeah. So I want to ask a question about that, but I want to yeah. make sure we touch on something about related to Oppenheimer yes, real quick. Here. Right. <laughs> um, and for, for those of you who are listening, who haven't watched Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer is a story of Robert J. Oppenheimer, who was called the father of the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. who led the Manhattan project uh, during the second world war to develop the atomic bomb that was used uh, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima during the Second World War. Uh, this focuses kind of on its life. It's based on the book, American Prometheus. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the author's name uh, to hand here, but it it's basically what it's based on. Um, and it's really kind of a look at his life and his mm -hmm. internal thinking. Um, so I'm curious to know um, your perspective on it because it seems like the movie is driven, it shows that he's driven by a desire to see this scientific achievement happen. And yet at the same time, he's very aware of the unintended and intended consequences right. of the suffering it could cause. Right. Um, what do you think of this portrayal of, of Oppenheimer? As yeah. A I, I mean, I thought Killian Murphy was just fantastic. And even if you go back um, and I love doing this, I, I will sit there with my phone as I'm watching a movie and go back and look at pictures. They had the time magazine cover. Um, yeah. And so I go back and look and see yeah. how accurate it looked very, very accurate. Yeah. Actually. I think Killian Murphy looks a lot like him. Um, I thought it was such a fantastic movie um, because again, you, you get the sense that at the beginning, he's all about the physics and he loves the science and he's so excited to, um, to, to create you know, and, and kind of modernize science. He, he was essentially the founder of the, the, not the theoretical physics, but the, some of the, one of the departments, one of the physics departments yeah. at um, Berkeley. Yes. Right. And um, so you get the sense that he's so excited. And even during the Manhattan Project, um, he's, he's very excited. He's good, excited to serve his country. At one point, he's wearing a military uniform. Yes. And one of his fellow scientists says, take that off. You're not in the military, <laughs> <Right>. you know. <laughs> and, um, so he's excited. But then he, then it explodes. And he, you kind of see this almost a change in him, I think, that he realizes Oh my goodness! This it's going to bring about this the destruction. It does bring about the destruction of thousands of people, you know, Im immediately with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, like you mentioned. But um, but in the long run, you know, he's he thinking the very last line. Spoiler alert! I'm sorry. Is about how. Um, there was a potential to have this chain reaction of where the whole yes. world would get destroyed, you know? Yes. And, and, um, and he says something about like, you know, I think Albert Einstein is talking to Einstein, Einstein yeah. in his last scene and Albert Einstein says something about, well, you know, that didn't happen. And, and, and Oppenheimer kind of ends with, well, maybe it did. Maybe it did. Maybe it did. We maybe don't we did know destroy the, the full world. consequences yet. Exactly. Um, um, so I thought it was an excellent portrayal. Yeah. I thought it was really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Movie. I thought it was powerful. The, again, the unattended consequences of it too. Mm -hmm. And and there's also this connection of like ambition mm -hmm. and um, because he's one side of the story. You also have Robert Downey Jr.'s incredible portrayal. Oh my goodness. Louis um, Strauss. Of Louis yeah. Strauss, that was, he was amazing. Uh, yeah. Who, who in his own way is also pursuing things out of ambition. Right. Um, but with a different, with, without imagination mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, yeah. It seems he's, he's playing the political game almost, is, is the, the sense I got from, from yes. most of the movie, right? Yes. He's playing the game to try and get that confirmation. Um, yeah. And in the end, of course, he doesn't. But anyway, go ahead. Well, I'm just curious from a historical perspective, mm -hmm. too, and, and maybe this connects to what you teach in the classroom, about um, maybe the, the responsibility of mm -hmm. pursuit of the next thing mm -hmm. and achievement. Modernization. Um, modernization. Right. Um, how it can 
bring about consequences that you yeah. don't intend. Mm -hmm. um, and does it does it help at all that Oppenheimer, uh, at least in the film, is portrayed as pursuing this not out of a desire for his own advancement entirely, but it's it's out of what possibilities, just surely out of obsession with this mm -hmm. unseen world that the people around him can't can't really see. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other great great things that have come out of that. Right. But curious from a historic perspective. Um, you know, how that connect, connects to teaching students about what we learn from great, quote unquote, figures like this. Right. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think a, a conversation that, that we kind of had a little bit earlier and, and what a lot of faculty members are having these days is about AI. Right. right. And it's kind of one of those, it's here to stay. We, we need to deal with it. Um, a comparison that was also made, and of course, this is not as like consequential as the atomic bomb, but like the calculator. Um, you know, early math professors just hated the calculator. This is going to destroy civilization. Like, huh. you know, students are going to lose everything they're not going to be able to do any math they're not even be able to add anything you know and well in reality like it's it's helped and and computers in general have have obviously significantly altered uh you know human civilization and um and so i think it's kind of the same with with ai i think we see the potential um i think there's so much potential good in this, yeah. Um, but we also we're, we're seeing the dark side of it as well, yeah. and and um, you know the dark the dark side being I, I read a story about a mother who got a call from her daughter, quote unquote, um, saying, "Mom, mom, they've taken me, they've kidnapped me." You know, thankfully this mother had a, had the wherewithal to realize my daughter is upstairs. You know, and so they, but it was her daughter's voice. They they mimicked her voice exactly. Wow, that's scary. And yeah, it is very scary. It's the dark side of AI. Yeah. You know, in terms of in the classroom, faculty of course is dealing with students not critically thinking and just going to AI, chat GPT, and typing in the essay question and getting an essay. Um, and so it's I think we're kind of in this balance right now of um, of we want to recognize like AI is here to stay, right? Yeah. And we want to use it and teach students how to use it in a responsible way that is going to, um, you know, bring about good things for this next generation. Um, but right now it's difficult because I think a lot of us are only seeing the downside yeah, right, of it. Right. Um, and, and maybe there's a connection of, you know, people who are trying to manipulate this for personal mm -hmm. gain are the right. ones to really look out for. Right. Um, and because anything can be manipulated and used, mm -hmm. even if it was intended for good. Right. Um, but having the the character and responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this, to me, it seems like there's a through line between these two films and mm -hmm. a lot of the films about history in general that have come out this past year, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a, maybe trying to grasp at the idea of human sin, mm -hmm. that we have this mm -hmm. propensity to evil, propensity to hurt each other, to have for, for greed and all of mm -hmm. these other things. How do you advise students to, to learn lessons from history as it relates to human nature? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think it really goes back again to this propensity of students to distance themselves from historical actors. And that's so dangerous to do because then it becomes a, an us versus them kind of mentality with, with history, with historical actors, and saying that was way back when that that was them, that was the Nazis, that was the Germans. Um, I'm not like that. I'm different. Today is different. We have technology. We have, you know, essentially we have the entire world at our fingertips with a cell phone, right? And so um, I would do something different. I would never do that. And that's so dangerous. Um, as Christians, we understand that that's just, that's not true right? That um, the Nazis were sinful human beings. They weren't crazy monsters. They were sinful human beings, just like you and I are sinful human beings, right? And so to think that we could not be participants in something like a uh, genocide, like the Holocaust, is just, it's arrogant and, um, and it's incorrect. And so I think it's so important for these students to, to study history, just to, to understand that and to understand the nature of man. Yeah. Wow. So. And and to finish up here, mm -hmm. what when you're studying history, when you're teaching history, um, where are you finding hope? 
mm. these days? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, you know, a couple years ago I was teaching. It's actually the first time I taught my Nazi Germany class. And and I had two students approach me after the class. And because, we again, we talk a lot about some, we have some very difficult conversations in this class. And I think it just elicits some really good critical thinking. And so I had two students approach me after the semester was over. And they said, Professor, we really want to start a pro-life group on campus. Would you help us? And just the, the fact that they were able to make the connection from the Holocaust to abortion, which you know some would argue, I would certainly argue, is the uh, Holocaust of our time. Um, that's why I teach, wow. <laughs> right? For students to be able to make these connections. And not only make these connections, but then do something about it. You know, right. we were talking about this director of the zone of interest saying, just be awake, be aware of what is going on. Well, these students were. Even though they were in the 1940s, they were, they were, we talked about the 1940s all semester, but they, they, they saw that connection between the Holocaust and, and abortion. That was just, it was kind of one of those like defining moments as a teacher. I was so proud. Wow. Of them, and that's what gives me hope um, amidst yeah. some really difficult times and studying some really difficult material, yeah. um, the, things like that. Those connections, those critical thinking moments wow. that the students have. Um, that's what really what gives me hope. It's really hopeful to hear that a student would study this period of mm -hmm. history and make the connection to say, "I need there is there is a world around me I need to be paying attention right. to." Yeah. And whatever might be happening mm -hmm. that requires me to to participate, right. uh, I'm responsible for that. So yeah. that's really powerful to hear yeah. that you had students kind of take that initiative. Yeah, it was really neat. Ending on a lighter note here. Yeah. Two questions. <laughs> One, I'm curious to know, do you have a movie that is so historically inaccurate or is so bad historically that you just can't... It, either drives you nuts or you just laugh about it because it's so funny. Yes. Okay. So there's, there's two of them. Um, and my students who know me, y'all are going to laugh at this. Um, but Victoria from PBS, it's a series. Okay. It's not a movie. I love Queen Victoria. Like my, um, a lot of my, my master's work was in German history. Some of my PhD research has been in, uh, Victorian British history. Okay. I love Queen Victoria. I love studying her. My ultimate goal is to be her governess's biographer someday, Louise Slateson. Wow. But I'll stop talking about her. My husband always gives me a hard time because I talk way too much about her. But um, Victoria from, from PBS, it's just a terrible depiction. Um, at one point, I didn't watch it for a long time because um, my mom called me. She was like one or two episodes in. She said, I had no clue Victoria fell in love with her prime minister. Like, mom. No, 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 no. <laughs> so that one is hard to sit through. I think I've gotten to, through two or three episodes, okay. and I was like, I just can't. I just can't do it. But in terms of what we're talking about today, um, World War II, ask any historian, and they will say Pearl Harbor. Really? Terrible movie. The, uh, oh, the Michael Bay. Michael Bay, from like, what, yes. 2002, 2003, Some, something like yeah. that. Terrible movie. There's so many inaccuracies in terms of like the technology, like the radio technology, um, the planes, the costuming. I mean, just everything. It's it's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and so that I saw a meme the other day of about this movie, Pearl Harbor, and it said something like, um, there are two accuracies about the movie Pearl Harbor. There was a base in Hawaii called Pearl Harbor. It was attacked. <laughs> that was it. And that's about it. And that's about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, so. I mean, Michael Bay gets a lot of jokes anyways. I know. That. Bayhem. You know, when you bring Bayhem to Pearl Harbor, I mean, what do you expect, I, I know, suppose? I know, right. Yeah. <laughs> Julie, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation today. Yes. Thank you for all that you're doing to, to educate our students, to help shed a light on significant parts of history and make that connection for today. And yeah. really enjoyed talking with movies about, uh, about movies with you Absolutely. today. Absolutely. Hey, anytime. Let's do it again.